I'm Andrew Arthurs. I played here from 1986 to 90. Bob Gothis. Uh... I was at Bowling Green from 1968 and graduated in 1972. My name is Bud Lewis and I played for Bowling Green and Mickey Cochran from 1971 to 1975. My name is Eric Nichols. I am the current head coach of BGSU men's soccer and I've been here since 2009. Chris Bartels uh, started 1972 till 73. I'm Jim Hodge. I had the pleasure of uh, playing for Mickey my junior and senior years of college, uh, 1972 and three. My name is Joe Sullivan and I played at Bowling Green from 2013 through 2017. All right, my name is Michael Golden. I played there in 1965. 1967 and 1968, graduating in 1969. Uh, Mike Sheehan, uh, Strategic Communications Office at BG. Mike Wilcox uh, from Toledo, Ohio. Uh, I was with Mickey from uh, 71 to 75. My name is Michael Anticoli. I played in the late 80s, 87-88 uh, season. Well, it was just good fortune. Um, as I said, I was at Hopkins and I knew I couldn't stay at Hopkins. Uh, my best buddy was, uh, whose best man at wedding was going to be the athletic director someday. And without a major, I didn't really have a future at Hopkins. I, I just couldn't teach service classes and run intramural program uh, forever. So I had been looking for a program that would be a match for me or certainly appropriate for me. And uh, I checked a few schools and uh, some of them were, were, one of them was in Florida and soccer hadn't even come anywhere near Florida. We were doing pro programs down there. But I said, if I took that program, the travel would be forever to try to come back up. I think Carolina was the next closest state that had the programs. Um, I had looked at a, a number of them and all of a sudden here comes the Bowling Green offer. I had two or three really fine former ADs that I knew and I had coached against their teams. I'd spoken at banquets uh, for other uh, programs and they recommended me. I think that's one of the reasons I got the job. I don't know what else it was other than my the folks liked me and they gave me a, a heads up for the job. And uh, from Rochester, New York originally, Penfield High School and followed one of my teammates here, uh, an amazing player uh, who introduced me to Mickey Cochran. Uh, I'll never forget my interview with uh, Mickey Cochran when I came to Bowling Green is very unusual that I actually came in and moved a couch and Mickey's house through his kitchen into his family room. And that signed the deal. That was the deal. I said, if this coach trusted me with his furniture, he, I hopefully uh, I'll trust him with my soccer career. Uh, so you know, for, he just comes off, first off, as just a regular guy, soccer lover. But I think there was some point way back when I was at a game and you know saw a guy look, look like he was somebody. Asked, you know, I asked somebody, and oh, that's Mickey Cochran. I'm like, the, the guy that the field's named after and yeah the, the guy the field's named after and then as I learned more about him you know he obviously knows a ton about soccer and lacrosse I guess as well but uh, I've dealt with him for soccer but you know not just on a local or regional level I mean on a national level he's well known you know you just see read about the things he's done and the awards he's won and it's not just in the Midwest it's nationally. He, he, he was uh... I don't, you know, he, he was just a darn nice person. Uh, he was, uh, you know, very, uh, very strict on the field uh, and wanted, uh, you know, 100% attention and 100% commitment. Uh, but once you got off the field with him, uh, he was like a second father to us. Oh, boy. And then we're, you know, we're, we're talking about a long time ago. What I appreciated about him, 
and I would, wouldn't be completely candid if I said my first impression uh, because I was um, away from home, 18, 19 years old, um, uh, on my own for the first time in my life. But what I appreciated was he was an individual that had an inner strength. Um, he showed positivity, uh, uh, and I enjoyed that as uh, in a uh, coaching style. So, um, uh, interestingly, when I met the, um, the other freshmen that came in, and many of us remained at the school, the university, for all four years, and we became the core of the team during our junior and senior years, uh, probably five or six of us. Uh, and we were starters both as juniors uh, and seniors. Um, that, that along with um, you know, Mickey's um, coaching style, uh, both as a disciplinarian, as a teacher, uh, but at the same time as someone who um, um, uh, reinforced uh, confidence in your play, uh, all of it was what uh, I responded to as a player. Um, uh, and I think the word I would use, Mickey, was was unusual. Uh, he wasn't uh, what you would call, in my mind, a typical coach, but he made things fun. And, you know, I've, I've never thought of practice as fun. I'm, I'm more of a gamer than a practicer, but... Uh, but practice became fun, I think, for all of us and the way he mixed it up and uh, his staff, Jim Plant and others that uh, were with us. And we worked awful hard at it and we got incredible results at it. And, uh, and those results are reflected in the, uh, at the National Lacrosse Center where, uh, where we as a team gave the, the pillar to the, to the field, the main pillar to the field in his honor uh, about seven or eight years ago. And uh, we honored him with that. And so uh, our Bowling Green Lacrosse is no longer with us. It will always be front and center at the National Lacrosse Center. And, and with the full and, and total credit to what I, what, all that Mickey achieved in those, those great years together. For Mickey, he's the father of the program. Um, it was it's part of the DNA. So when I came, when I came aboard, that was instantly uh, made known that there was a legacy here and it was very apparent, uh, you know, Mickey was always present, uh, but in, you know, in the background. Uh, Palmo, you know, was, was a player of his and, and you could tell that there was a, there was a direct link uh, to the quality and the, and the success that, that Palmo carried on and, and I think it carries, you know, carries on to this day. First time I, I met uh, Mickey was when I arrived at Bowling Green as the dean of the business school. Uh, I had a chance to go to a, a men's soccer game, and by chance, uh, and as you know, you know Mickey comes to virtually every game. Um, but by chance, I, I had a chance to stand next to him, and, and he probably doesn't even remember this, but I uh, had a chance to chat with him a little bit, and in his very understated way, uh, provided some observations about, uh, you know, about the game that was going on. And, and then it was subsequently, I, I learned much more that I was speaking with Mickey Cochran and about the amazing legacy that he has created and continues to create for Bowling Green State University. I'll just say, really? Um, you know, a, a crew cutted guy in the early 70s, well, you know, our hair was touching our shoulders. It was more of a, uh, a time warp culture shock when I first laid eyes on him. Well, you're not gonna get this job unless you know who Mickey is and you've done your research and um, you know so everything you learn about him by talking to people and whatnot you, you know that this is a special man. Um, first day I met him was at my press conference when I uh, announced when when the university announced that I was gonna be the next head coach. Uh, he was there in the audience and um, just as humble as could be introduced himself to me and my wife as if we didn't know who he was and of course we did um, and then you know since then on 
I can't think of a home game that he hasn't been to. Uh, he comes uh, he comes to trainings on a regular basis. We uh, we get lunch on a regular basis, and uh, we talk on the phone uh, regularly. He's just uh, w what a what a remarkable man, and what a, a great resource that uh, for for me to have. Well, I think my first impression of Mickey was kind of like a little starstruck because you had heard all of the the legend and and rumors about Mickey and kind of who he was as a person, the impact he'd had on the program. And then when you got to meet him, you, you realized what a special person he was, how down to earth he was. And I, I will never forget, like, first time I met him, just how much he was smiling in such, in such a good mood. Um, and that's something that I'll never forget the first time you meet Mickey Cochran. Well, I put it this way. He was completely different than my high school coach. Uh, Mick was such a nice guy and... We figured, okay, he's making a presentation on recruiting. He's going to be a nice guy. But uh, he was soft-spoken. Uh, he was enthusiastic about the programs. Yeah, he was a likable guy from day one. <laughs> uh, if you didn't do it right, you ran and ran. But uh, it, he, uh, he pushed us. Uh, and he wanted, uh, he wanted us to be the best we could be on the pitch. And uh, I think more importantly, I found out later, uh, he wanted us to be the best that we could be as just individual citizens. He was just an excellent mentor for me. And, and in so many respects, you know, he gave me guidance, not only by what he did on the soccer field, but how, how he how he and his wife got along and how he was with his children. When you're coaching uh, full time with the commitments he had, I was always impressed at how family centered Mickey was. And he created the atmosphere of our team to be family centered. You know, he made our practices enjoyable, creative. Um, the humor that he brought into it uh, with jokes like, what's the capital of Kentucky? Is it Louisville or Louisville? Well, we would always say Louisville, and he said, no, it's Frankfurt, off you go. And uh, just, just, uh, that just kept the, the, the mood uh, uplifting and fun. Uh, it was just, just a really, a, a very, very, I was very fortunate to have played for someone like Mickey and, and what it impacted my uh, coaching career. I'll tell you what, it was, uh, it was fun. I mean, I loved preseason. I loved going two a days. I loved being on the field every minute of the day. And uh, it was a new experience. We, we all loved it because the fields were so nice. We'd never played on fields like that in our life. And here it was green all the time. The weather was beautiful. Uh, Mick was well organized. Uh, we had a lot of fun. Rigorous, uh, deeply planned. I've never ever seen a coach plan a practice like he did. And he planned in, uh, he timed things correctly. You know, when you could best use sprints and best use long distance runnings and best use a completely different crazy break where you broke into to teams and put on plays and, 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 and tried to write poems. And uh, uh, he had a way of making practices were different every day. And if you, I coached 25 years of soccer following, and that's an exceedingly difficult thing to do, to maintain uh, the attention and the focus of your players. Uh, training was probably more elementary, far more elementary than it is today. Uh, conditioning, certainly, and uh, basic soccer skills, remembering that uh, most of us, nearly all of us, were from out of state. And those that came from Ohio uh, were picking up the sport for the first time. Um, so there, there was a lot of elementary skill development. Uh, maybe by the time we were juniors and seniors, we were really talking about strategy and tactics, uh, not to the extent that they do today, or, or being able to play with the speed of play that they do today, but relative to that time, we became a, uh, a much more of a competitive soccer uh, team, uh, but it, it was a, a mixture of everything. He was a teacher as well as a mentor and coach. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what they were doing back then, um, but I know they were good. 
they won a lot of games, and uh, Mickey was having a huge impact on those guys. And, um, you know, I, I'd like to think that the, the game has evolved enough and the athletes have evolved enough that we would, we would have a good chance at playing those guys. But I think there was a toughness with those groups that, that scares me a little bit. And Mickey, uh, I've seen some pictures. I think M Mickey had one of those, uh, I don't know what kind of, um, what are they hats? Like, uh, like a Bear Bryant hat. What, do you, what would you call that? Fedora. Yeah, okay. So, and even Mickey would have like a fedora. And I'm pretty sure I saw him smoking a pipe on the sideline. So, you know, that, that team, those teams would just have a different edge to them than, than what we have now. Jim Hodge called me up uh, one day, uh, probably in the uh, maybe early 1990s, 92, 93, and indicated uh, that he had an idea uh, as a tribute to uh, Mickey, as a tribute to the coaching staff, uh, that uh, you know we uh, we should we should pool our money and create a stadium, um, and it would be in st ultimately it would be in stages. Uh, but the first stage was the important one, and that is fence it in, create um, uh, stands to seat you know, a number of thousands of people, um, and that'll enable then us to show others uh, what we've achieved to get additional people involved to create what you see now, which is a, a, you know, a, top, uh, a top ranked uh, stadium with um, uh, both the uh, lights, sound system, um, uh, various trees and uh, shrubs around it. So, uh, but it was uh, Jim Hodge, I give him full credit um, for reaching out to me and to probably a few others. And, and um, we raised enough money. The university, I believe, matched what we raised and it enabled us to take uh, a field that um, already existed. It was the first field that the university had um, back in 1967 was the first year we played on it. Um, and then um, really make it into a, a, a stadium that can host NCAA uh, tournament games. So Cochrane Stadium has is, is got to be one of the best in the country. And I think it's... Um fitting um, that it's named Cocker Stadium after Mickey and also that his alum are, are the ones that uh, really made that possible through their giving and that's uh, a true testament to, to their time here and um, what Mickey has meant to them during their time and, and the lessons that they've carried on through their lives for them to, to be um, so dedicated to the program to, to be willing to give back and, and invest in their program and the the facility with Mickey's name. That he was just always um, always there. We knew he was always looking over the program. For me, I think one of those really unique guys that were able to connect with generations of people, and that you may have to remind him that, that hey, I'm Andrew and played from '86 through '90. But as soon as I did, he's making connections, and I watched this game. I remember watching you watching you play, um, which is remarkable. Um, mo most most people can't uh, don't have that connection with people, and he's he's done it for fifty years worth of players here. Yeah, but I don't know if <laughs> I don't know if I want to say it where it's going to be memorialized. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, I have I have one. Uh, my sophomore year, I pledged uh, a fraternity, uh, and uh, we had a game against Ohio State uh, away. And the night before, uh, it, it was Hell Week, uh, and uh, we were taken out uh, to the airport or the old airport, and we didn't get back until uh, very early in the morning. And I overslept, and I missed the bus. And uh, uh, I was scared to death, and after uh, the game, and I had to wait till uh, you know Mickey got back home. I had the next day, I think it was Sunday, I had to go back over to his house and to explain what happened. Uh, and uh, he sat down and he listened, 
and uh, you know, he talked to me about responsibility and commitment. And uh, that's great. Oh, uh, it was. I was impressed. Uh, Mickey Cockham was uh, a coach who grew a lot while I was a player of his. Uh, Mickey got involved with the National Soccer Coaches. He was a historian of the association. But with that in mind, he brought the National Soccer Coaches uh, coaching education program to Bowling Green State University, and he hosted in 1972 the licensing uh, uh, camp here. And, and I, Mickey went through those courses uh, and each and every year that I played for him. And each of every year of his practices they became more, uh, they just were better and better. Uh, I don't think I ever remember being bored or we've done this so many times. Mickey was creative in the sense of, of providing activities that were uh, challenging, that helped develop as, as, as individual players, both technically and tactically. And I think he grew a lot with the, his involvement with that uh, coaching association and particularly with the licensing in the camps that he hosted at uh, Bowling Green State University. Oh, I got a hundred stories. Uh, I'll tell you the one that stands out when we're talking about leadership. Uh, it's a year I, after I graduated, well, I hadn't graduated, but my eligibility was up and I was helped coach. I was an assistant and we were playing at Kent State and the refereeing was just atrocious. We were, we were just getting screwed over left and right and I'm still in the player mode and I'm losing it. And I kept on saying to Mick, you need to do something. You need to say something to this guy. And he said, no. He said, this is not the time. And he said, I'll, I'll write a letter uh, and we'll address it. And he said, but if you're the kind of guy who screams all the time, it goes in one ear out the other. He said, so when I say something, because I don't say some, something often, he said, it holds you know, a lot of water. So that was a that was typical with Mick. He didn't lose his temper much. Unfortunately, I think the, the times that he did lose his temper were directed toward me somewhat. Uh, but most of the time, he he just was able to deal with us, and uh, we were a difficult group group of guys back in '72 when we went to the NCA. But I think that's what got us there. But his ability to hold us and corral us, I think, was outstanding. I'll tell it offline and then maybe I'll come up with another one. Uh, we had a okay. guy on the team, Stephen Cutler from New, uh, New Jersey, and he, he loved pizza and he didn't play a lot. So he's on the bench a lot, me, me too, on the bench a lot. And uh, so one day we asked uh, Domino's Pizza to open early and make him a pizza and, it, and have it delivered to the bench. <laughs> So pizza for Cutler, you know, he was walking behind the bench and, you know, lots of people found it hysterical. And to this day, with that intensity, that was a moment that he remembers and not fondly about me. So uh, I'm not so sure if it's a good addition. Um, I, I don't remember anything till the culmination of it. I'm, an, I'm uh, in the front of the bench and the on-deck players, or the guys that may get into the ball game, are sitting on the bench behind. Somehow, Hodgie got the idea of ordering a pizza for Steve Cutler, who was another guy on, on the bench. I knew nothing about this until the pizza guy arrives and says, pizza for Steve Cutler. Well, then I heard about it, and I was not particularly pleased. That part I do remember. Uh, the game was going on. I can't remember if we were in control or not, but uh, we didn't uh, stay long with that. We expressed our displeasure and went on. But that was my remembrance of it with the uh, commotion behind me. And of course, people were enjoying that. And I don't know how many teams ordered pizza during a ball game for a player. Obviously, there's with Mickey, there's never, you're never short on memories that you've had with him. I think. Something that I will always remember with him um, was just him being around the program and being around the team as much as he was during my time here at BG. 
I remember games where, you know, the whole Ohio weather where it's 30 degrees, it's either raining or sleeting or snowing. And after the game, sure enough, Mickey Cochran's on the field. He's shaking hands with all the guys, telling them congrats, or I think you could have done this better. Or, I was really proud of you when you did this. And like, what a testament to Mickey about being involved in the program after he was done coaching and really being close to the, the players and the team afterwards. So I think for me, that's a memory that, that I'll never forget with Mickey. Awesome. For me, and, and the presence of Mickey in and around the program is what I really remember most about him. He, uh, you could tell that there's a lot of pride that he, that he held for, for not only the program, but the school, uh, and then the players and coaches that were, that were built around that program. So for me, looking back on it, he was just always present um, in a very unassuming way. He, you know, it was, it was very, very common to look over during a practice or a game and, and see him just looking on. Uh, not necessarily interacting, but just looking on, and you could tell there was a lot of pride there. And I think for, for our coach, for Palmo at the time, you know, there was, um, there was a sense of duty there to uphold and to, to carry on what, what Mickey had started. So, uh, um, I do recall um, some of the motivational techniques um, and building team bonding. And that might be uh, milk and cookies at his house uh, uh, and, and him driving around in, I don't know if that was about a 1940 uh, car uh, I, that I still have, I have pictures of. Um, but I do uh, recall that when a number of us um, years later decided uh, to invest to build the current stadium. Uh, and it's, in its infancy, we uh, put up stands, we built the fence, the, um, and uh, my, the, I think when we uh, inaugurated it to Mickey in 1995, um, you know, my son was uh, 11 or uh, years old, maybe 12 years old at the time, and um, uh, Mickey was just so sweet with him. Because uh, he, came, my son Justin came out uh, to the university with me to be part of the ceremony. So um, you know he's uh, was much the same post his active years and in his retirement. Um, it, it, much like um, you know the best leaders in in anything, whether you know academics or in business, have that personality type that people. Uh, get uh, it's kind of that magnetic uh, type of a personality that people aspire to be with. You, anytime you you talk talk to him about soccer, I mean, you can just tell he's his love for the game is just so strong, and he'll he'll tell stories and like he's must have a photographic memory or something because he'll tell a story about you know oh in 1973, you know in the 79th minute this guy drew a foul and then this guy and. Uh, I've talked with Coach Nichols about that. You know, you'll anytime you, you go back and look something up, and like he's dead on. And it was 40, 50 years ago. It doesn't matter. Like that's he remembers what happened and how it happened. And anyway, so over the years, as I became provost and, and president, then uh, you know, I always seek Mickey out when I when I go to a game because uh, I just love talking to he and his wife and just to hear about um, uh, some history. I learned some history. Uh, and he's just a very astute individual, as we all know. And I think part of that is because he views himself as an educator, as, as a teacher, as well as a coach. And, and uh, you know, early on in higher ed, uh, professors were coaches and coaches were professors. It, it was so tightly integrated. And, and often when you, you talk to, to coaches today, which you know, no longer because of specialization and all of the other kinds of reasons, uh, coaches in most D1 programs wouldn't be uh, faculty at an institution. But when you talk to those great coaches, they always talk about themselves as being teachers. And I think that was the secret sauce of Mickey Cochran. He views himself as not only a great coach and, and he knew the game and how to motivate and, and, and strategize, but he was also, he cared about the players, uh, so focused on their success and their personal and professional development. 
And um, over the years, I've had a chance to talk to many alums at Bowling Green State University that played for Mickey Cochran. Their passion for this institution and the game they love is because of Mickey Cochran. I guess uh, Mickey and my dad were kind of similar. It was, you know, that that commitment and responsibility and do the best that you can do. Uh, and, uh, you know, I carried that, uh, you know, on, you know, when I went into the military after I graduated and uh, in, in, in my career in law enforcement with the federal government, it was, uh, you know, if you're going to do something, you do it 110%. Uh, and, and if you fail, you just pick yourself back up again and uh, you do. And, and that's all you can do. And, and Mickey instilled that, uh, you know, in, in the players. And uh, he did it in a way that, uh, you know, he was never judgmental. I can't think of a time uh, when even when you did something wrong uh, that he that he addressed the negative. You know, there was always at the end of whatever the discussion was, it ended always on a positive. Well, one of the things I appreciated that Mickey did is was his service to the the National Association of Soccer Coaches, and uh, that inspired me, I think, to stay involved. And uh, I've had an opportunity to, to do so uh, over the last 40 years with the All America Committee. But Mickey's involvement as historian and somebody who valued the the role of, of the collegiate level at the at the youth level at the high school level his leadership of the National Soccer Coaches Association his service to soccer in this country is one reason why he was selected to the Hall of Fame uh, the United States Soccer Hall of Fame that's an amazing accomplishment amazing achievement and wonderful and deserved recognition as I said completely different <laughs> from my high school coach my high school coach we learned to win uh, out of fear uh, we were so scared to lose, uh, and he was what we would say was an equal opportunity abuser. And when we came to BG, you know, five of us, when Mick would lead, we were like, okay, when, when is he going to start yelling? When is he start going to call him us names and stuff? But he was always in control. You know, the one thing Mick knew is how to deal with people, and he dealt with us not like little kids, but adults. And uh, he never got ruffled. Uh, he knew exactly what he wanted to do and when and how he wanted to do it. So uh, it, was, it was nice to see. You know, it's not like we didn't have problem guys, and we were some of the problem guys on that team. Uh, and refereeing back there was atrocious. And the way he handled referees, so cool and calm, uh, it, to be honest, it really helped me later on when I spent 11 years as a coach at the University of Memphis. Uh, I learned a lot on the way he handled situations and the way he handled referees. Mickey's poems uh, were prepared, uh, as I recall, uh, for the day, the practice the day before we had a game, or we often were over at uh, Mickey's and, and Pat's or Trish's house and he would read poems and they would they would be uh, not poems out of a book but poems that he wrote and they and they would include uh, whatever the team we were playing and what happened during the week and uh, where we could really go and the importance of the next game uh, and uh, I think that, that was another surprise <laughs> for people to adjust to really the guy, this guy with the crew cuts breaking into poetry. That's interesting. Um, and then it became a part of our expectations of this is how we prep. And actually, you know, I think poetry can be played out on a soccer field and it's one of the ways he moved from intensity of coaching to intensity of creating memories. I got nothing. I got nothing. That's um, there's a lot of a lot of places that I fall short from Mickey, and that might be the the biggest. I can't those poems, and we hear so much about those poems, and and he's written us a couple poems since I've been here, and uh, we've even had some 
some alum write poems. Um, it's like that was um, definitely a unique thing that I've never heard of in any other program. And if you talk to any alum who played for them, they talk about those poems and they absolutely love them. So I, I'm, you know, I apologize to my players, but uh, I'm, I've got nothing. One of the things about Bowling Green, we lived about what a mile and a half, two miles from campus, and uh, Friday nights before a Saturday game, we'd have the team come over to the house, and uh, my wife would make brownies, uh, whatever it might be, and the kids would just sit around the living room, and we didn't talk too much about. Uh, the next day we wanted just to relax and have fun. And somewhere along the idea, I wanted to have a culmination for the evening, so I would write a poem. And they were la da 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 They were like a limerick. And they were not, uh, I could write them almost off the top of my head. I usually would write them in the afternoon and then read them at night. And I never realized till years later that, that they were a hit. So anytime we'd have a reunion, anytime the kids, the alumni would come back, uh, I would write a poem. And if I didn't have a poem, I, I, I dare not come, out, <laughs> come together. You had to have a poem. The body slowed down with each passing year. Weight lighter on top and heavier in rear. But the old moves are still there. So you never fear and remember the good days, the alumni are here. I, I would say one of the things that I've practiced that I, I, I certainly as an adult recognize, I didn't uh, as a, you know, as a 19 year old and a 20 year old is that positivity that Mickey uh, lived by and still lives by. So. Some people might describe it as being inspiring, inspiration. If you imagine Mickey was taking uh, kids that some of whom had never played the sport, you know, others uh, were good players, um, teaching them uh, both uh, and getting them to practice skill, basic skills, and also working on strategy and tactics. And at the, at the end, after years, not weeks or months, you know, he finally had the nucleus of players and a team that could compete on a regional basis in the, you know, in the Midwest. Well, you've got to be an optimistic type of a person to um, invest all of that time, uh, you know, to uh, as well as love the sport, uh, um, you know, to get uh, people to be able to play uh, like that. So um, I've carried that that part of me, uh, my eternal optimism uh, has carried me through all my entire business career. Well, I think I had a discipline to it. I think they knew I was going to have fun and they were going to have fun, but at the same time, if we were screwing up, that wasn't going to go. And it wasn't going to go with my players or my assistant coaches or me. That wasn't to say you didn't have a bad day of practice. I don't think I don't think we ever just sent everybody in, but we'd do some running and we'd say, okay, let's start all over again. We'd send them around the field. We had what we called, I wish I could think of the thing, uh, what it was like a, a marathon run. Uh, they called it Indian running. And you'd have six in a line and he'd sprint to the front and then the next guy would. And you could do those as long as you wanted to. Then we would also play 2v2 full field, which was tough. And the team that scored got to go off and the other team had to stay. And you don't think that didn't create a work under pressure because you were so mad you had to stay in and you had to control that anger. And I can remember a couple of kids that just would walk away and we'd let them walk away because they were dealing with that anger. So we had a, a heavy hit and a discipline, but it was also blended in with the idea of, let's get a little bit better each day we play the game. Coach Nichols, um, I, I've gotten to know over the years uh, here because he is also 
uh, served uh, the institution and, and led the men's soccer program for quite a few years here recently and has, has really brought the program back to uh, a, a position of strength playing in, in the championship uh, you know, uh, this past year and uh, really recruiting great student athletes uh, to Bowling Green State University and, and absolutely I, I think Coach Nichols is, is naturally a teacher as well as a coach. His concern and interest in the success of each of his players and his fellow coaching staff is absolutely obvious whenever you engage uh, with him. And, and, um, and I also know that Coach Nichols has spent a lot of time uh, with Mickey Cochran and Coach Cochran. And, and um, you know, I think anybody that uh, is effective in their job uh, make sure that they spend time with mentors and understanding that each of us in whatever role we have, we, we are leading an organization, we're coaching a team, but it's built upon that amazing history that is the foundation of the program. And, and so Coach Nichols and his engagement with uh, Coach Cochran, former Coach Cochran, I think he, he understands how important that history and legacy is and how to learn from Mickey, how to learn to continue that great legacy of soccer. Yeah, Gary was, uh, Gary was something else. Uh, Comac, New York, he was one of the ones <laughs> that Bill Jerome sent me to find. Uh, he had uh, trouble with eligibility, and I think he was working up at Steak and Ale or someplace up, and he was, he was a draw. I mean, he, whatever he went into, whether it was going to be in the restaurant business or something else, but he stopped going to school. And I went up and got him, and I said, this, you got to come back. This, uh, this coaching and teaching is just made for you. And he came back, and he got his degree, and then he was with me. He and Chrissy Bartels were probably the two players that stayed and coached with me longer than any of the others. Jim Plon in lacrosse was the other one that was with me the entire time. And the uh, commitment that they had made and the enjoyment they had was was something else. Anyway, to Pombo real quick, he, there was something about him. We'd go to clinics. We'd be spreading the game in Northwest Ohio. And we used to kid, Chrissy would take one group, I'd take the uh, defense, and he'd have the offense. And Pombo had the keepers. Well, you break the kids up and all of them would go to Pombo. Everybody wanted to be a goalkeeper. They didn't want to be goalkeepers. They wanted to be with Pomo. He took this program, which was doing well, and just took it to the next level. Then he had the World Cup venue in Detroit. Uh, what, 94? I think that was. Anyway, and did a heck of a job up there. I didn't think we were going to get him back. And it was just the next year we lost him, and that was just uh, tragic. And, and Greg Brooks, who was another tremendous player and a pediatrician out of Columbus that looked out for almost any soccer player that needed anything down there or any athlete actually. We lost Brooksy and uh, those are the things you you think of what these folks would have been had they been able to get the goal the full go. My memories uh, principally of her as a, a wonderful host uh, for um, cookies um, and milk uh, at their home. Uh, but my guess is, uh, as I've grown older, um, you know, no one does it on their own. And so the amount of uh, emotional support uh, that she must have offered to Mickey, you know, who was developing a soccer program and and uh, developing a very successful lacrosse uh, program. Um, so that, that, that emotional, personal support must have been enormous. That as a 20-year-old, frankly, um, you know, we weren't mature enough even to recognize. But as you grow older, um, 
you'll, you know, you, uh, you come to appreciate it even more. As much as Mick taught us about the importance of teamwork, he taught us about the importance of partnership. And Trish was a big part of our team uh, and a big part of our family. Um, she taught us uh, something intangible called uh, the art of hosting or hospitality. Uh, to always feel welcome in her home or in the kitchen nook. Um, and I can't help but think that if the world was invited to sit at Trisha's table, it would be a lot more kind. It would be a lot more just. It would be a lot more inclusive. And that's uh, very timely now. Uh, and I could wish that for the whole world, that uh, you could feel part of that warm sense of welcome. That, 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 that's how I would describe the Bowling Green soccer um, community and alums. Um, it, it's the, the connection when we have alumni weekends or when Eric connects, connects us all is amazing. That, that there are, I mean, there's a common thread and quality um, and that starts with, with what Mickey set and established. So um, I think it's really, I think Eric's discovered this, it's really, really unique um, that for a relatively small Division I school, the amount of success and the amount of really remarkable people we've had come through here, that, that's, that all started with Mickey and, and, uh, and what he established 50-some years ago. I think as long as Bowling Green soccer uh, is there, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, what Mickey has done, not only in the soccer program, but with that, uh, uh, you know, all the other things that he's done with the, uh, uh, I forget the name, uh, where all, all of the memorabilia, uh, you know, that he, uh, you know, has uh, put together of the university, you know, it, it won't die. You know, his legacy is, will be there as long as, uh, you know, it gets passed down from people like myself and, and when Gary was alive and, uh, you know, Bob Bartels and, uh, you know, a host of guys that played with him, you know, pass it on. And what's really interesting is that, uh, is that the coaches that have come after, uh, especially Gary Palmazano, who was a fraternity brother of mine and came from Long Island, and now, uh, you know, Eric, uh, they're just like uh, Mickey. And uh, that's what I think keeps everybody wanting to come back uh, to uh, Bowling Green, no matter where we live, is because, uh, you know, quality coaches who want the people to win, but more importantly, they, 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 want, they want the kids to be good young adults and citizens. Well, let me tell you a, a, a neat story. Uh, 1978, I went to the coaches convention. It was held in Atlanta. And in front of about 3,000 coaches uh, at a banquet, they give out the honor award, the most prestigious award given to uh, a college soccer coach affiliated, or I should say a soccer coach affiliated with the National Soccer Coaches Association. And they do this amazing introduction, which they won't tell the name of the person, but they describe his record or his experiences or his uh, history and I started putting the pieces together pretty quickly and realized, oh my gosh, Mickey Cochran at Bowling Green State University is gonna be the 1978 Honor Award recipient. This is amazing and I'm here to see this. This was fantastic. I could, I get goosebumps just thinking about it today with uh, 3,000 people standing up and, and congratulating him with a standing ovation on his amazing career and work that he had done for the association and for soccer in the USA. It's enormous, it's huge. Uh, starting a program is difficult. And starting a program in the Midwest like Bowling Green, you know, very difficult. And he was able to do that both with soccer and lacrosse. And uh, the, the kind of athletes he brought in, the kind of people he brought in was phenomenal. And, you know, he built two very strong programs. Uh, and his legacy, you know, was outstanding. I, going to the convention every year, the soccer coaches convention later on, uh, you know, Mick was... Uh, <laughs> 
held in high esteem across the board to whoever you talk to. So his legacy is is huge. I mean, the game the game is um, completely different than it was back then. Um, Mickey will be the first to tell you that, and the alum will be the first to tell you that. But the thing that that um, hasn't changed it's the values of those guys uh, that Mickey instilled back in the day, and I think that that's. Uh, one of my responsibilities as a head coach here and then whoever comes after me is uh, has the obligation and responsibility to continue to stay connected with those values that Mickey put put in place in the early days. Uh, we do that by trying to connect our alum with our current players um, so that those short stories and perspectives can be shared uh, and then in one day our players will be sharing those with, with future players in that way that these, these values and Mickey's leg legacy perpetuates. So what I'll remember is that he thought there was more potential in you than you thought or believed. And so it was a pleasant, constant raising of the bar. And uh, that's a life lesson. In fact, many things about Mickey uh, turned out to be lifelong lessons. Uh, particularly, uh, you know, we don't go through life uh, denying problems, difficulties, hurdles, stumbling blocks. We go through life despite problems, hurdles, difficulties, and stump, stumbling blocks. So it, w it will always be the spirit with which he showed up and asked us to reach up. He created the fabric, fabric foundation um, of a, a program taking uh, student athletes who um, wanted to continue to play a sport um, that they were good at um, and he enabled them to excel and to uh, develop a further love for and compassion for the sport. You know, for me, I think, going all the way back to the very beginning when he started the program, you know, as the father of the program, the things that he instilled in it that continue to this day, uh, respect, pride, intense competition, uh, looking out for each other, uh, bringing it every day. You bring your A game, even if you don't have your A game, you bring it uh, and you figure out a way to, to, to make it work and to create success with what you have. And I think for us and the, guy, the guys that have played in the program and, uh, and use the memories and, and the, the skill set that, that they acquired here, I think those guys will go back and, and touch on those same things as well. So Mickey's legacy is, is, is really unparalleled. And uh, after I'm gone, I think all these people are still going to be coming back and, and renewing those those friendships and those memories. Memories are what I live for because <laughs> they are uh, such great fortune. Respect. Integrity. Character. Unique. Optimism. Dedicated. Family. Uh, goat. Legend. Gentleman. Perspective. Wise. No, no, no. Legacy. But when you look at this thing, how could you ask for anything more than to have the people that have come here and the success that we had, which is no guarantee at all. You just had good things happen. You had to have something that was going to blend and come together to make it, make it work.